Well, thank you uh, for coming all, and thank you for inviting me to uh, speak here about, um, well, I would actually say one of my passions from early days, because back in the 80s, when I uh, started out uh, working with technology, I, I actually started out as a, the first target of my hacking was the telephone system. So my name is Ralph Monen. I'm uh, currently a technical director and uh, also part owner of Secura, a security company in the Netherlands. Um, <clears throat> and as a, as a as a freak in the in the 80s, um, there were a, a lot of things to play around with. So what I want to do first is go through a little bit of history of the uh, phone hacking scene in, in the Netherlands and the EU in general, uh, what the landscape looks like now, and, well, some current methods of intercepting uh, communications, and actual some new vulnerabilities that we discovered in the uh, 4G voice communication implementations. Um, <clears throat> so... If you have any questions in between, please also feel free to answer. I mean, I'll ask. I mean, I don't want to be it. We leave all the questions until the end. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. Um, so, as some of you might know, but maybe some of you do not know yet, um, freaking the, the the art of phone hacking started out actually in the 70s when this guy, Captain Crunch, uh, John Draper, discovered. Well, he didn't really discover it himself, but he became famous with that discovery um, that you could intervene in the phone protocol signaling systems by whistling a little flute that was actually part of some breakfast cereal box. And you whistled it into the phone receiver and something happened. Well, what happened was actually that the phone systems were communicating with each other using, well, a very simple protocol based on audio tones. So 2600 hertz was actually the frequency of that audio tone. Um, this became a whole, yeah, little industry of making devices that could generate these tones so that you could interfere, well, hack the phone system. This was, a, at that time, mostly an American thing. The signaling systems that were in use at that time were quite simple. They were sort of documented, and <clears throat> by trial and error, people found what worked and what didn't work. So they built little devices, like the one in the middle, called the Blue Box. Um, the one in the middle actually has a little story behind it, because it was built by Steve Jobs. And he built and sold these devices at Berkeley, and that's how he got his first little bit of seed capital to start building the Apple computer in his garage. So he also started out as a freak. Later on, um, the whole scene um, became you know, more organized. A magazine started, 2600 Magazine. I'm, pro I'm sure most of you have heard of it, know it. Um, and in the 80s, we actually featured on a, on a cover when we had the first Galactic Hacker Party in Amsterdam in 89. Um, that was a cool party, and um, we did a lot of phone freaking there, too. So, <clears throat> um, how does this work? Well, if you dial a number these days on your mobile phone, you don't hear anything anymore. However, in the background, there are certainly signals being generated, even audio tones. It's called DTMF. You probably know it from the older phones when you press the buttons and you hear e e e e e etc. Um, well, that's the protocol that is used for the end user devices. But the phone exchanges between themselves also use a similar protocol, um, just different frequencies. And sometimes when you make an international call to a very, very far country that is not as advanced as us in Europe, you can actually still sometimes hear those little bleeps and artifacts going on in the background. The problem, of course, with this is that audio is what the phone system is meant to be transporting. So as an end user, you can inject these signals yourself. And of course, if you have full control over the signaling system, then you can trick exchanges into doing all kinds of stuff. So you can make it think that you are a phone exchange also, and 
make it drop the connection, but keep the, what they call the trunk, open. So the other side is still listening for signaling systems or signaling signals. Um, but the original number that you called was um, dropped. So you could reconnect to a new number. The um, signaling systems have names, so you have R1 and R2, CC, ITT4, C5. Um, the, they all sound a little different. The one that was used a lot here in in, in Europe was actually uh, C4 and C5. So you can go onto that FTP site and they have masses of examples of what they sound like and it's pretty cool to listen to sometimes if you're nostalgic for that stuff like I am sometimes. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so in the 80s, a little group formed around, um, you know, the, the, the magazine Hactic. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that was the Dutch sort of hacking magazine back in the 80s and also early 90s. Um, and, well, we found out that if you dialed 06022 numbers, which is the equivalent back then of what now is 0800 toll-free numbers, you could get connected to all kinds of systems in the world like faxes, modems, but also hotel reservation desks of a hotel in Egypt, for instance, or some office, some big multinational office in the US. So these international lines, we found out pretty quickly, they allowed freaking. You could use the C4 system or the C5 system to inject your own signals and gain control of the, uh, of the trunk. Uh, this was good fun because um, you could now make secret free phone calls, get connected to all kinds of chat rooms and the operators uh, all around the world. And you could do social engineering attacks through that because if an operator gets a call from another operator, you're operating on a different trust level. So we could social engineer these operators into connecting us to all kinds of numbers. And I remember one time when we were sitting in Amsterdam, we called Korea, made the switchboard in Korea call the operator in the US and made the operator in the US call back to us and had the phone ring on the desk next to the phone that we were calling from and it had about a three second, four second latency, but it worked. Um, and another big use of this, of course, back then was uh, dial-in lines were expensive. So freaking was actually also a way of getting free phone calls. I'll go into the legality of that later, but anyway. Um, these days, of course, um, these old-fashioned signaling systems are hardly in use. I, I, they're not totally gone yet. Sometimes, as I said, if you call to, I don't know, Botswana, you probably can still find some old trunk there that is analog and uses these tones. Um, of course, there's been people that have implemented this on uh, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, so you can actually go in onto YouTube and just Google this Arduino-based little blue box, because that's what the devices were called to make these furry phone calls, and it has all the signaling systems in it with audio examples, and it's a quite a fun thing, little project to build. Um, it won't get you far, though, these days, because, as I said, it's all digital now. Because what happened was that late 80s, early 90s, we transitioned to ISDN digital lines, and the biggest security measure that was taken was that this whole signaling system was brought out of band. So they built a new digital network and the signaling system SS7 that was implemented there is actually still used and also abused. Not that you can get access to this SS7 um, network as an end user, but um, there are cases where you can access this, sometimes through malicious parties in some parts of the world. You can buy access to SS7. Certainly all states have access to SS7. Um, and what does SS7 give you? Well, basically, if, if you are, um, if you can access SS7 and the protocols that run on that network, there is a trust between all the operators. So if they see a signal coming in over some connection from some country, they assume that it is trusted. And what it allows you to do, for instance, is retrieve encryption keys for roaming voice calls, uh, reroute voice calls, reroute SMS text messages, etc. So having SS7 access is basically uh, a very powerful hacking weapon. 
Now, fortunately, uh, providers have become savvy to this and they've implemented actual SS7 application layer firewalls. Um, this is, however, not the topic of my talk. Because after the whole digitalization and, well, ISDN was here for maybe a decade and then silently left the door, we all switched to GSM. So first 2G and later other protocols. Um, so 2G is pretty well known that it has quite a few vulnerabilities. Uh, for starters, uh, keys can be brute forced, uh, 64 bits. So you can uh, build a table and crack it. Um, and another big vulnerability in the 2G system is that the handset, so your GSM, has to authenticate to the network, but the network does not have to authenticate to the handset. This means that anyone can impersonate a network, and as long as you can trick the phone in connecting to your network instead of the real one, so KPN or Vodafone or Proximus here in Belgium, um, you will be able to gain a man-in-the-middle position. Yeah, and This worked quite well. It's becoming more and more easy to do that. In fact, it's actually trivial at the moment because if you buy a $300 Blade RF, download Gate BTS, which you can run off a little single board Linux computer, you can build your own, well, 2G interceptor that way. Um, we use, for instance, a setup like that uh, when, we, when we're when we testing uh, IoT devices with a 2G SIM card, because this is still used for machine-to-machine -machine communication. And yeah, you don't always uh, easily at least uh, can see what goes over the 2G connection and where it goes to, but if you just built an interceptor, a man in the middle, then uh, that's quite easy to do. Um, <clears throat> again, legality issues aside, technically it is very possible. Um, there are there are ways, by the way, that you can officially run a, uh, a BTS yourself legally because there's a couple of frequencies and as long as you don't advertise yourself as a legitimate network so you just stay on the test network and the test name then you're fine in most of Europe not everywhere um, so then we got on to 3G um, which was more secure already because the network now also had to authenticate to the handset so no more man in the middling like you could in 2G. Um, however, in 3G networks, there were other attacks. Um, for instance, the providers started selling, uh, um, uh, what are they called? The um, uh, Pico cells, Femto cells, um, which basically are 3G base stations with a backhaul to the core network of the provider. Supposedly, this was, you know, for, as a range extender for in home. So you could buy these little Femto cells from Protophone or your provider. Um, they actually work quite nicely. They, most of them have a little Linux kernel and some of them are hackable. So you can then get root on the device, extract the encryption keys for the communication of the backhaul and decrypt that. And then you can see exactly what goes over the line. And in fact, you can turn your femto cell, if you can gain root on it, often into the same kind of man in the middle link device as you can with a 2G um, radio. So <clears throat> there's quite a bit of research on that published already on the internet. So I would uh, say go and look if you're interested in that. However, it is 2018 and now we have 4G. And 4G is a, an actual, a totally different beast because 4G does not really do voice communication. 4G does data. So it is an IP stack. It is wireless IP, except for... Um, longer ranges and different situations than Wi-Fi. So, um, so how do you transport voice over 4G then? Well, they introduced 4G LTE, voice over LTE, or Volti, which is basically VoIP. Because we have that technology, we know it, we understand it, it's been there for decades, well, not many decades, but quite long. Um, and it, uh, it handles the uh, the call signaling on the handset by the phone software. Ah, don't I recall something from the 80s when I had access to the signaling system? Yes, it's back. So we can now 
on a phone, see if we can, um, you know, manipulate this. And you can try it on your own phone if you have a SIM card and a subscription that allows uh, Volte calls to be made. You have to set some settings. In most Android versions, you can go to the um, dialer settings, enable Volte calls, and you will actually see a little uh, high-definition symbol in your display when you make a Volte call. One of the, you know, big advantages, well, more marketing advantages, but is that they say that the, the Volte calls have a much higher audio quality. It's true. I mean, it, the, the clarity is quite big on a Volte call because the frequencies that they, the frequency band of the voice, uh, transmission is, is actually much wider. So it's a clearer call. Um, anyway, so apparently with Volte, we might have a chance of freaking again. Um, <clears throat> so if you take a look at an Android phone, and I'm uh, everything in this talk is assuming a rooted Android phone, by the way, because in a non-rooted, you will not have access to these things. But we can root phones. That's not a problem. Um, so there's two interfaces, uh, RMNet 0 and RMNet one. Actually, there's more, but these are the ones that are the most important. So RMNet zero is the actual data plane. It, that's where if you are using uh, your 4G connection just to surf to the internet, it goes over RMNet zero. RMNet one, however, is the Volte plane. And that transports the SIP traffic. Um, interesting to note, though, that it's not the voice traffic itself that is transported over this interface. That is handled by the baseband modem. You do not see that in the kernel uh, on the Linux uh, kernel that is basically what Android is. So you uh, can't sniff the, your voice traffic using this, but you can see all the signaling, which is what we were after anyway. Many countries, their providers, they use IPv6 on this RMNet1 interface, and most of them use an IPsec tunnel to connect to the SIP proxy. Um, so if we sniff that interface, really what we're sniffing is an encrypted tunnel. So that's not much use. However, there's a couple of tricks. First of all, um, there's a hidden setting in Android, um, in IMS settings, that allows you to disable the encryption layer, so the IPsec tunnel, on the handset. And often, not always, but often, providers will honor that because somewhere in the 3GPP uh, protocol stack, it says that uh, phones that do not support IPsec must be able to make faulty phone calls. So I just pretend that my phone does not support IPsec and the provider says, okay, that's fine. Um, luckily now, all the providers in the Netherlands have fixed that. So if you disable the IPsec encryption on your handset, it does not longer work. So, <clears throat> a couple of details, because if you uh, actually go into uh, into a shell on your rooted Android phone, you can uh, you can type in IP transform policy, and it will tell you exactly what the details on your IPsec tunnel are. Of course, you have to do this at root, but it's fine. And you can see what source IP addresses and destination IP addresses are used for the tunnel entry and exit points. Um, and the one that we are actually after is the IPsec keys, of course. But they can be easily retrieved with the IP transform state command. And you know, uh, on the on the picture there, you can actually see the encryption keys. So that's an easy one. Um, it's also interesting to note that um, you have, uh, let's see, that's on this one. Yep. Um, you have a triple DES encryption key. Are we still using triple DES? Yes, we are. Are we still using MD5 HMAX? Yes, we are. Um, it's not necessarily a problem. Uh, it's just interesting to see that um, triple DES is still in use with a two key and not a three key configuration. Basically, it's equivalent to about 80 bits of security. Now, um, 
this is not the encryption that is used for the over-the-air communication, meaning that if you are able to intercept your 4G radio traffic, yeah, you will not be able to use this key and decrypt the radio traffic. This is the encryption key for the IPsec tunnel that already goes through that radio layer. So we're not talking about being able to sniff from the air and decrypt that. We are talking only about sniffing your own traffic from your phone to the provider. Um, <clears throat> so we can do that uh, if you're root on the phone quite easily by uh, setting up a uh, simple proxy. We're using ADB, so the uh, Android debugging bridge, and then exporting the keys, just copy-pasting them over into Wireshark, and um, then you can actually see all the traffic and the SIP going um, from your phone to the SIP server, actually the SIP proxy. Um, interesting things to see here. Well, first of all, it sends a register, SIP register message, which tells, basically that's when the handset is telling the Vaulty server, hello, I want to authenticate, please. And it gets an unauthorized message back. And in that unauthorized message, there is a nonce, a challenge. Then the challenge gets sent by the dialer app to the whatever process is running on Android that handles communication with the SIM card which transports it to the SIM card and says, hey, I have an authentication request here. This is the nonce. It sends it to the SIM card, and the SIM card does a little bit of trickery with a secret key that we don't know and we cannot retrieve from the SIM card. But the answer is sent back to the dialer app, and the SIP implementation then sends that answer back to the SIP server. And if that uh, is successful, then the handset is authenticated after that, and you can start making and receiving calls. Um, so from there on is standard SIP, and um, you can do a SIP invite and a SIP message in some cases. SIP message would be then a text message, an SMS message. So <clears throat> what else can we see? Well, this RMNet1 interface has, um, a, if you take a look and you do some scans, on it, some ping scans. You can see all kinds of equipment. You can see um, servers that are there, maybe some firewalls, other interfaces. And sometimes you can even reach internet through it. Um, except that is not build that internet. Yeah, because the billing on the data on a call is different than from the actual data charges on RMNet zero. So if you're able to reach internet, this is not possible in most European situations that we've checked. Um, but it, and certainly in some places in the world, this still works. And you can get free data if you use, if you just set it up a routing table in your Android phone to go through RMNet 1. Um, another option to abuse that uh, would be if the internet connection doesn't really work, but then still sometimes the DNS on your RMNet 1 interface will still resolve internet addresses. So you can do DNS tunneling. Um, and there's all kinds of infrastructure discovery stuff that you can do over that RMNet1 interface, as I said. So it's quite a bit of an attack surface that you have with, with a routed phone running 4G. Um, so coming back to that authentication, it's interesting to note that the challenge that is received by the handset is sent to the SIM card. And then that calculated response is sent back to the server. Um, there's a trick we can do here. We can share SIM cards. Because if I receive that challenge, and I send that challenge over a different path to another phone that is running a bit of software that receives my challenge, sends it to its SIM card, and sends me back the response over Wi-Fi or maybe the RMNet Zero interface or whatever, it doesn't really matter, um, then I can have another SIM card authenticate my phone. You can even do that with multiple people. This is a trick called card sharing. It's used quite a bit also in the satellite hacking uh, business because if you have one card for you know watching uh, Canal Digital or whatever, you can share that card with multiple people. 
How? Well, there's pieces of software that will do that for you over internet. The challenges will be sent to the card, decrypted, sent back over internet, and you can watch TV for free. Um, so in this case, you can actually use it to share SIM cards. Um, this could be a problem, for instance, for lawful interception, because now we have multiple uh, phones that are connected to the network that uh, are authenticated to make voice calls, but using one SIM card in a totally different location. So who made the phone call? I don't know. Um, quite difficult. And probably also a, a good fraud scenario here, because if one SIM card is stolen or gotten somewhere, it can be just abused by 10, 20 people that way. Um, note, however, that this is a, although we, we, we know it works, um, we have not implemented anything to do this, but it is a possibility. Um, <clears throat> other things that we tried that were successful. Um, replaying SMSs. So if you send an SMS from a phone, sniff that traffic, replay it, um, then you will see that, in some cases, that uh, that message is again sent. And if you resend that same message from a different phone, it's also sent. And the receiver will see the original originating number on its display as the sender of the SMS. In fact, the original sender will get billed for the SMS. It will be subtracted from his uh, data bundle. So, um, of course, this has been fixed again by the providers that we found this in. But um, it's a cool trick. Uh, we also found that you can use these replayed SMSs to enumerate users because it has a little kind of session ID in there. But that session ID is so small, with, uh, you know, uh, you could actually try most session IDs pretty quickly. And if you send a, a text message, if you just manipulate that part of the SIP header um, and you send that uh, to the SIP server, you will get an error if that session ID does not exist. And it will tell you what the phone number is that is that doesn't exist. Right? Um, so you can enumerate users quickly, and you can also know who is using 4G that way. Again, that one was fixed. Um, now, this was a very interesting one. We only found it in one provider, and yes, it has been fixed. But um, that was only in the Netherlands. I have not tried this in Belgium or England or Germany or anywhere else. But um, if you make a phone call using Volti, in the uh, pro uh, progress uh, SIP headers, you will find a P access network info header, which has a cell ID and a location area code in it. And this is the cell ID and location area code, not of your phone, but of the person that you are calling. So, and you can do this silently. And then you can go to, I don't know, uh, opencellid.org, type in the cell ID and LAC, and you have located this person. Now, um, <clears throat> interesting to note here, though, is that um, this only worked on one type of equipment, uh, the Guys have fixed it now, so this shouldn't be possible anymore. But as I said, we haven't tried this in other countries. Uh, it would be very interesting to see. Uh, we know of one other country that had this problem also. Um, but um, yeah, if any of you are uh, up for checking it yourself, I mean, you'd only be sniffing your own traffic and you'd be knowing um, quite easily if this was the case here in Belgium or another country. However, um, anything else? Oh, yeah. Um, if you use a, uh, most providers support this, if you do uh, pound 31 pound and then make a call, it will suppress the caller identification on the other side. However, the phone number is sent anyway in the SIP headers, so it's not an anonymous call anyway. And of course you can see the IP addresses of the call recipient's handset, and actually also the EMI, the equipment identifier, your email number, gets leaked to you, to the person that is calling you. And I, all this information is retrievable silently by simple, simply making a call. And before it starts ringing at the other side, hang up. But in that short period of time, these headers have already been sent to your uh, phone 
and you can uh, then see them. And it will not show up in the call logs at the other side. Um, Fulty also has a cousin, because you, obviously, if you can do this over 4G LTE networks, you can do this same trick over Wi-Fi. So this is faux Wi-Fi. And I <clears throat> don't know if any of you have used it, tried it. Uh, it's Vodafone actually uses it quite a lot in the Netherlands and KPN also. But um, basically, it uses your own home Wi-Fi connection to do the same. And it has another IPsec so it's a double IPsec um, to go through. So it makes it a little harder to retrieve all those keys and decrypt it, but it has the same functionality. Um, <clears throat> actually, the, usually it's just a different channel to transport it. The actual server configuration and everything on the other side is exactly the same as in Faulty. So um, lots to play around with. So in conclusion, um, yeah, freaking is quite back, but in a digital way. So we have, instead of analog little tones, now we have SIP messages to play with and manipulate. Um, and why? Well, it's because the providers just simply did not assume that this layer would be available to the end user. And most of the weaknesses that we found, actually, I'd say, except for the SIM sharing attack, because that is something uh, that that's simply how the system is designed. All the other issues are implementation issues. It's not protocol weaknesses in the sense that, you know, the 3GPP stack is wrong. It is simply the vendors that have made this equipment have implemented it incorrectly. So we can do SMS spoofing, card sharing, that subscriber location stuff, and the privacy issues. Um, a few notes, though. Legality of this. So um, interaction with an operator's network, of course, can be tricky. Um, I would urge you not to start doing stuff on an operator network. They can find you, and if you do anything stupid, they will. Um, however, observing your own traffic, no problem. There is no problem in that. It's your own traffic. You're looking at it, at it on your own phone. Um, and... You might think, well, how did you do the replaying of the SMSs and that kind of stuff? Well, of course, um, we didn't do that as a part of our own research. We were actually commissioned to do this by a, um, uh, a phone company in Holland. Um, so we were actually allowed to do that. Um, also, a lot of the work um, has been done by uh, Berry Bussers. Um, he did a research uh, internship at our company on this topic, and I worked with him on this also. Um, he's the one also that wrote the little app for the Android phone that so that you don't have to use Wireshark, but I can now just, it's called SIP Watcher. We haven't published it yet. We might, but uh, we'll see about that. And basically, on a rooted Android phone, you just press um, the, uh, uh, activate the SIP sniffer, and make a phone call, and it will display all the SIP messages and all the headers in your display. So that's Barry's work. Um, responsible disclosure was followed in all these cases, um, and all these problems have been fixed in the Netherlands. So we have four major operators in the Netherlands, uh, KPN, T-Mobile, Tele2, and uh, um, Foda. Um, they all responded quite well. Some were a little slow, but in general, I would say that uh, within half a year, they'd uh, fixed all these things. Um, and for a telco, half a year is fast, yeah, especially if they have to go to vendors and ask them to update uh, you know, networks that are rolled out uh, on a national level. So we're actually pretty happy about that. Um, but that is just the Netherlands, and I have a feeling that there's a whole wide area of research still to be done here. 4G is, is definitely not out-researched yet. And 5G is on the horizon. Um, that'll be a whole nother challenge. But there's still enough work to do on, on, on 4G. So, um, yeah, that concludes my little talk. Are there any questions? Questions?
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the question was, how about the iPhones? Because I talk about Android. Well, um, I'm, I'm sure that you could figure out some way to do the same thing on an iPhone if you jailbroke it. However, Android is just so much easier to interact with this whole system because most phone manufacturers allow uh, unlocking of bootloaders and easy routing of the Android phone. Uh, also, we can compile our own tools easily for Android and uh, make make apps without having to go through Apple stuff. So, I mean, that closed ecosystem from Apple, great, nice and secure, but it doesn't help our research. So we chose Android. Any other questions? Thanks for the talk, by the way. Maybe a bit naive question. When you have on your phone, it says 4G. Yeah. But that when you have bad coverage, it goes like 3G or E. Does it mean that you actually downgrade to older protocols or it's just something that your phone displays? Like No, it means that, that you've downgraded to older protocols. So you can yes. make it actually go downgrade and do all the old attacks. Yeah, of course. Okay. If, you, if your phone is connected with 2G, then you can do all the 2G attacks. In fact, that is how the... Uh, if you if you want to intercept 2G and make your phone connect to a 2G, most phones these days they like to stick to the higher, uh, you know, the newer protocols. It's actually a preference setting in your phone. You can say 2G only or 3G preference, 2G second or 4G, 3G, 2G. You can set the preference in your phone. So if you have it on 4G preferred and you go out of coverage, it will automatically go back to the fastest protocol that it has, which is 3G. And if that is also out of range, it will drop back to 2G. Um, there's another way of doing it, which is highly illegal, but in theory, you could um, send out a, a jamming pulse on the 3G and 4G frequencies, and your phone would automatically fall back to 2G. Once it's on 2G, there's another little trick that you can uh, um, do so that it stays stuck on 2G because there's a parameter in the protocol that says what the minimum signal level must be for the uh, phone to jump to another uh, frequency band, so up to 3G or 4G again, and as long as you make that uh, minimum signal required very high, it will stick to 2G because none of the other signals will be that strong. So, yes, you can downgrade it. All right. Any, any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Ralph. Okay. Thanks.